All right, the year's winding down. The holiday slowdown season is just around the corner, but temperatures aren't the only thing that's dropping. So are our boot camp prices. Don't let yourself get pulled into the holiday cookies on the couch downtime just yet, because CyberWork listeners will get $500 off most live online boot camps through the end of the year. If you're looking to land your first cybersecurity job, maybe you'll consider earning your Security Plus certification. This can be your first big stepping stone in your cybersecurity journey. And if you want to really make your resume stand out in the pile, you might want to earn your CISSP. That's one heck of a leg up. You're going to be uh, holding the most requested certification in cybersecurity job listings in the U.S. at the moment. But whatever your career goals, we have training for you. We've got certs from CompTIA, ISACA, ISC Squared, EC Council, Cisco, Microsoft, and more. And keep watching this channel through the end of the year, because in the middle of each episode, I'll be showing you around some of the offerings in some of our top boot camps so that you can see what you would be learning on your path to certification and it becomes a little more real for you. All right, look, the best gift you can give to future you of 2024 is taking decisive action now and smashing holiday season malaise with the gift of certification. Book an upcoming course before December 31st, 2023 and save $500 on your live online boot camp training. And just when you thought gift giving season was over, well, okay, I'll give you one more. Your training comes with an exam pass guarantee. Now, that means if you don't pass your exam on the first attempt, we'll provide a second attempt at no extra cost to you. I mean, come on. So don't snooze. Take decisive action in your career. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to learn more. Again, that's infosecinstitute.com slash free and book your next certification boot camp today. Now, don't worry about it. Don't overthink about it. And don't let the last couple of months of 2023 go on cruise control. Trust me, you are ready right now. But are you ready for today's episode of Cyberwork? Well, I hope so, because here it comes now. Today on Cyberwork, my guest is Anthony Pasilio, VP Neurodiverse Solutions at CAI. I met Anthony at this year's ISACA Digital Trust World event in Boston, and I was immediately fascinated with his insights on hiring and attracting neurodiverse professionals in IT, security, engineering, and related industries, all of which are, as you know, suffering a skills gap and all of which are in need of new insights and working methods. Anthony and I have a substantive conversation about changing the structure of the six-hour marathon interview process, the difference between an employee who stays in one job role versus an employee who stays in but reimagines that one job role, and why this new way of hiring and recruitment can lead to nothing less than an entire transformation of a company's work culture. Any ideas to take you into the new year? That's all today on Cyberwork. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Anthony Pasilio is recognized domestically and internationally as an expert in neurodiverse employment and currently serves as vice president of CAI Neurodiverse Solutions. Pasilio specializes in advancing neurodiversity programs and leads the global expansion efforts of neurodiverse solutions at CAI. So Anthony is someone that I met uh, at the, this year's ISACA conference in Boston, and uh, we immediately hit it off after his presentation, and I and I wanted to have him on the show to talk about the work he does and how it uh, intersects with uh, cybersecurity positions, cybersecurity jobs, cybersecurity uh, leadership, uh, and the uh, role that neurodiverse uh, people can play in that. So, Anthony, thank you uh, so much for joining me today, and welcome to CyberWork. Yeah, thank you, Chris, uh, and I appreciate it. It was a good time at ISACA way back when. Um, I know. And we, and we did indeed... Uh, kind of hit it off there. So I'm glad it's all the things that we talked about came to fruition. It's all coming together here. I know it's a, you know, even if it's at the end of the year, we we got it to work. So, uh, uh, so yeah, to help our listeners get to know you, uh, I want to get a sense of your career journey. So before working with CAI, you spent years working in product management, software, software engineering, and mortgage bank, banking QA. Uh, your career is now strongly intersects with tech and cybersecurity, but I wanted to ask about your relationship to tech growing up and in your educational years. So was software engineering a role that you sought out or did the opportunity reveal itself at the right time? Were you were you moving towards tech at that point or did that uh, did, did just an opportunity open? Yeah, and, and I think my, my, my quick answer is uh, I didn't seek it out, it sought me out, but mm-hmm. I can give you, you know, the love of technology from when I was a young 
kid, uh, you know, my dad used to bring home these these crazy things like um, uh, like a, like a disc player, like way back in the day. And then we were the first ones on the block to have the Commodore 64 with the yeah. dot matrix printer and the floppy drive. Like, that's awesome. And, and we had a lot of, uh, you know, I, I was the remote control as a kid and then we got <laughs> sure. remote controls. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So I've always loved how it kind of intersects with what people are doing in the world and how it actually connects everybody in yeah. the world. Um, you know, th- that pretty much led me into, you know, throughout elementary school and in high school, I was kind of in love with with radio and television and, and it just kind of blossomed from there uh and i went to college and i have my radio and television degree my mass media degree so i was behind the camera in front of the camera using all of the technology okay. way back in the 19 yep. early 1990s when you yeah. know and, and we were one of the uh first colleges that had a remote truck so if you see tv programs oh, yeah. today mm-hmm. You know, they have these big trucks and they can do all the, the cuts from the cameras and the sound. Mm-hmm. But way back when, in 1991, it was unheard of that a community college, no less, had its own truck. So that kind of got the juices flowing and did a long, you know, a, a good stint in that. Um, and then I thought I was going to be on, you know, ESPN. So I graduated, went right. to Florida and, you know, it, it, that obviously didn't work out. Um, and then. I came into banking. Right. And so Mm -hmm. my very first job was was collecting. But over the years, it it kind of morphed. Right. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, geez, uh, 2008, probably, um, you know, I left one financial institution, went to a healthcare institution. And that's where the whole kind of QA and, you know, Mm -hmm. UAD and all that stuff started to come together. Right. Fast forward a little bit more. And then I became like the administrator of uh, ALM, like quality center for, you know, pass fail, all that good stuff, defects. Um, And then it just, it it came into mortgage banking. So it, it honestly, it really did come at the right time for me. And and I didn't go look for it. It just kind of, that's how the evolution came from that's awesome thank you that's a that's a great answer so uh the biggest shift in your career track um uh anthony appears to be in in 2017 at least in, in terms of our story here when you were employed with jp morgan chase and co your your job role transitioned from vice president mortgage banking quality assurance which you just told us about to vice president autism at work so that's obviously a very formative year for you so can i ask you more about this shift in role within the company? Was this something that you created for yourself? Was this a opportunity that again, made itself known and and came to you and you were raised your right hand to to grab it or, and what were the aspects of your work life to that point that made this switch feel like, aha, now this feels right. Yeah. Well, I, the opportunity arose in when I was in the QA area because we needed more talent, right. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get, QA analysts to come in to do that manual testing. I see. Um, and, and so we had to find an alternative pipeline. Um, so we looked outside of the quote unquote normal or traditional ways of, of finding talent to find that particular pipeline. And the governor of Delaware at the time uh, and JP Morgan Chase were, were, were on the same path. Um, folks who are on the spectrum, you know, autism, they wanted to see if we could pilot something that would work at J.P. Morgan Chase. Mm-hmm. So we kind of started developing the program. And, and my boss at the time was kind of leading that effort. And I was his chief of staff. And it it really, it again, like hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I yeah. knew. Yeah. Um, and so we we developed that program then. You know, I did raise my hand and said, hey, listen, I need to be involved with this. So, Chris, and and what we haven't talked about is, is, you know, kind of that neurodiversity, like the term neurodiversity, right? It's a different way of thinking. The brain processes things different and includes um, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, anxiety, depression, PTSD, like all of those things. 
Mm-hmm. And I always knew Chris it was a little quirky, a little different mm-hmm. um, and, until my diagnosis a, a lot of years, a lot of years later. Um, but, you know, I felt at home when that program started and it it obviously blossomed to, to where it is today. I've left a couple of years ago. It was the global head there. Um, we had 300 people in 10 different countries doing mm-hmm. 40 different job roles, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, people are always thinking that folks who are on the spectrum, they can only do this or that. And yep. we kind of blew that out of the water. So, nice. um, yeah, I mean, this that was the aha, now this feels right moment. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I don't want to stay too long on, on past jobs, but can you talk about what you what your role was in, in terms of, of VP uh, autism at work? Like, what, were you sort of managing uh, these, the, the folks here, or was it like an ERG or was it, what, 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 what was actually involved in <laughs> creating this JP Morgan Chase, uh, sort of group within a group? Yeah. Part, part of my job was to find different areas within JP Morgan Chase that wanted to pilot programs. Right. So, okay. And once we had four individuals in there, but we were looking at What's the environment like that they're walking into? What's mm-hmm. the noise level? Where are they going to be sitting? Yep. Who is who is their manager? Like, how does that manager give feedback? Like, those are the things that we had to go out and I see. Bet, right. Mm-hmm. And then we said, well, if they're going to be in a certain department, do we need to place them separate from everybody else because of, you know, whatever noise concerns or, you know, mm-hmm. just just anxiety and stimulation general. and yeah, right, right. right. Mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. course. Um, and I think that was a large part of the, the job at first is putting it on its feet. Um, and it was really, it was about um, kind of relationship building within the financial firm, but it's also understanding the people that are coming in now, what it takes to sustain and retain a program like that, right? right? We we do, so we started seeing cultural shifts, and we mm-hmm. had to do training and education. And part of my job, which is going to translate nicely right here and segue yeah. nicely, is that we had to find vendors who could supply the candidates, who could supply that education and training, right. could supply that support, because we didn't have that initially. Mm-hmm. So CAI was actually the very first vendor that we chose. Okay. Uh, for JP Morgan Chase. Interesting. Um, you know, and, and it was extremely successful. Um yeah. and you know, hence two years later, uh, yeah. you know, or a couple of years ago, right. um, CAA came calling. That's great. Okay. Well that that well, perfect. I, I didn't need to do any sort of uh, transition at all because but that's that's where question three goes here. So you're obviously your main role and, and the focus of today's episode is as VP neurodiverse solutions for CAI. So uh for Listeners who don't know your organization, could you walk our listeners through the day-to-day work you do as VP Neurodiverse Solutions for CIA? Are there certain yeah. like buckets of tasks that are consistent yeah. from week to week? Are there certain things that occupy most of your focus and time? Uh, just yeah, just but, through a little bit. I, I think, and, and and I'll give you kind of the backstory. I think he, our founder Tony Salvaggio, he, he's passionate about helping people with disabilities and and neurodiversity in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, we've been a collaborative partner with several organizations for 30 plus years who benefit people with disabilities and and their caretakers like Easter Seals Disability Inn. We have CAI Cares. Um, So, you know, when this neurodiversity program first started in 2013, you know, the, the, the very first client was the state of Delaware, which again, as we go back to the beginning of the question, it was Governor Markell at the time, uh, the governor of Delaware, who was really kind of the the glue that brought everybody together. Okay. Um, you know, and I, I think like my day-to-day activities are a couple of things. I'm the brand and media ambassador. So Chris, I love You're doing you. your work right now. <laughs> I am indeed. So anything yeah. to do with with the media, that is a, a piece of my job, right? Whether whether it's writing, you know, uh, thought leadership or or doing podcast or you know mm-hmm. doing uh, television interviews, that's part of it. The other piece that I do each and every day is I try to help companies and organizations build neurodiversity at work programs, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe we have existing clients that haven't 
dabbled in it, right? They have a chief diversity officer, but it's race, gender, ethnicity, disability, yep. physical, you know, yes. those sorts of things. Neurodiversity has kind of been put to the side and, you know, kind of go to the holiday theme, right? We're at the kids' table, yeah. um, you know, eating Thanksgiving dinner, and now we have a seat at the, the adult table. Yep. Um, and part of my job is making sure that we stay at that table. Yeah. I also big part of my job is I'm looking at colleges and universities, right? Okay. I'm looking to see what they're doing with their, their students. Uh, are they building a program? Do they have a program? What kind of curriculum are they establishing? Do they know what's down the path in cyber, right? Do they know mm -hmm. that stock analysts are going to be the, the new thing or the bigger thing, right? Yep. And we have to be able to influence that a little bit. And that's part of what I do as well. I think, okay. um, you know, kind of the, 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 the personal piece to me is, again, I am neurodiversion. So when I go to these places and I do these things, the vested interest is in making sure that there's opportunities for people who want to work to be employed. And that is, in essence, my job. Yes. Fantastic. OK. That, yeah, that, that puts a nice structure around everything we're going to discuss here. So, uh, yeah, thank you for, for walking us through that. So uh, CII's website says they have over 40 years of excellence in uniting talent and technology. Was autism and neurodiversity and its clients part of their MO from the beginning of that 40 years? And if so, can you tell us even by shared history, since you clearly haven't worked there for 40 years, like how CII's methods have changed and progressed to how you create solutions now? I mean, obviously, you've been you worked with you, you know, uh, CAI four years before you came to work here as well. So, um, how how do you how do you see this uh, having changed in terms of perception or the way yeah. work gets done, and especially over a forty year span like that? That seems like yeah, a, so, a massive. so absolutely. So I I think and I reference it a little bit. You know, in the beginning, in, in 1982 ish, when the firm was first started, um, you know, I was IT staffing, doing you know, service, it, whatever it may have been way back when, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there was always the passion, the empathy of making sure that the underserved, the 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 underemployed community was was always at the forefront. I and see. so, you know, I, I talked about the whole Easter Seals and Disability Inn, but where that starts to change and morph even more is in 2013, when they started spinning up the gears and building the sport internally so that we could do, uh, you know, at that time, it was mostly um, folks who were on the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now it's, it's huge. It's 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 everybody who is neurodivergent. Um, yes. You know, think about it this way, Chris. Mm -hmm. you, you have a, a firm that's you know forty years in. You're you're starting. You got a public sector. You got a commercial sector. Now you have CAI neurodiverse solutions. Mm -hmm. Kind of a different you know ball of wax than the other two sectors. So you have to ensure that you have the support built up. Your HR. You got to have your mm -hmm. service delivery. You got to have your job coaches and mentors. Maybe you don't have that on the other sides of your business, but in this business, you need to have that. Um, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, our our support mechanisms with our team leads and the way that we do it is an all encompassing support mechanism, not just on a daily basis for the people that are doing the work, but it extends 24 hours a day for the sheer fact that if somebody finish their day of work and they have some anxiety, we want them to be able to talk to us about okay. what's going on. Um, so, you know, I, I just think, you know, and the other thing is it kind of goes back to the JP Morgan Chase. There was a talent sh shortage as well. We, we oh, had yeah. to find in 2013 alternative pipelines to find candidates. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, and we talked at Isaka a little bit about this, you know, the, the cyberspace Obviously, we know it continues to grow and jobs are going to be, you know, going left and going right and all yeah. different things are going to come in. We have the lot. We have a ton of talent untapped and we got to find that talent. We got to bring it in and we're going to show you the different ways that people think. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's fantastic. So to that end, I mean, we 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 sort of talked about that in terms of like one large bucket. And I want to kind of separate a few things out here. So Anthony, what are what are some of the variables when thinking about neurodiverse solution strategies in different portions of the tech sector? Like, for example, are there 
specific challenges or emphases when you facilitate structures for IT roles versus cybersecurity versus engineering versus data an an analysis? Is that is does it or is it more just like here is here is employment and here are the things you know uh, that we we help to facilitate? Yeah, well, I think neurodiversity in, in general, um, the 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 pieces that make up that are you know things that are can be se sequential, mm -hmm. or there's a finite task orientation, or there's a visual aspect, or there's pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. All the things that I'm talking about right now, don't they fold into cyber? Right? They, I Absolutely. mean, they fold no into question. all IT, to cyber, to engineering, to data analysis, Completely. like all of those things. So, you know there's a plethora of job opportunities that are waiting to be filled, right? We talked about SOC, we, uh, compliance analysts, identity access management, vulnerability and, and pen testing, incident response, like all of those things. If you took a look at somebody who is neurodivergent, those skills and aptitudes, that is what makes kind of that whole sector a great fit for somebody yeah. who thinks differently. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think we're we're trying to close that cybersecurity skills gap a little bit. Um, you know, sure. the world's going to gain some innovative thinkers um, who bring problem solving talent to protect that critical data and that infrastructure. Yeah, for sure. Now, do you do your clients also include uh, neurodivergent professionals in leadership roles or capacities? We talked a lot about SOC analysts and incident response. And then, you know, that's the sort of like, get your hands dirty. Like you said, the pattern <laughs> recognition and the, and the deep focus and stuff like that. Do you, do you work with, uh, uh, leadership roles in that regard as well? Yeah. So, so one of the things starting way back when was we were filling all these entry level roles, right. And, and we still do, right. That's the crux of what we do because, we're finding individuals who are just breaking into the job market. But what we found along the way, and, and now the statistic is one in five individuals is neurodivergent, right? One of the things that I mentioned, so 20% of the population that you're working with or working side by side is affected by whatever that may be, right? Yes. Um, and so there's bound to be leaders in those spaces. You know, we know the the famous ones, right? Elon and you know some some other folks that are that are at the top. But I think our job, and yes, we do work with leadership. Our job is to ensure that the people coming in have career pathing and mobility to get yeah. those leadership right. jobs. Part of what we do is making sure that we upskill if necessary. Mm -hmm. But we're also making sure the companies that we work with, they understand that we're asking them up front, please make sure you just don't have a SOC analyst one and they can never go to SOC analyst two or three or yes, right. in departments. We have to think more broadly than that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we, we know that, um, leadership roles across the globe are filled by amazing human beings who are neurodivergent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, that, that makes sense. And and uh, yeah, I guess I was I was trying to get a sense of that um, the the sort of movement up the hill. Uh, you know, like you said, because uh, you know, I, and especially if it's being done in a perfunctory way, there's that feeling of like, all right, we got one to tick off the box. Yeah, we got yeah. we got a, a sock analyst, but it is such an an active conversation that you need to have with yourself your as as a company you know and so to do that means to be uh, sort of rethinking just so many different aspects of 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 work so so to that end one thing i i saw discussed in your post uh that you shared from CII was uh is your work to rethink the interview process in a way that doesn't shut out candidates with autism or other neurodiverse learning and processing methods so what's involved in rethinking the interview process what is that what is that what, what would that, that look like, like? Yeah. So listen, traditional interviews that we've we've mostly seen over the past God, 50, 60 years, mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies do that panel style interview, Yes, uh, which we know doesn't work well for somebody who's neurodivergent. It doesn't yeah. work well for me either. So if I'm sitting across from you, Chris, and five other people and you're yeah. firing off rapid questions at me mm -hmm. and I have a delayed processing as part of my neurodiversity, my neurodivergence, I should say, mm -hmm. then you're going to think that either A, I don't know the answer yep. or I'm just, I'm, I'm 
anxiety ridden, I can't do the job. I am probably yeah. anxiety ridden, but taking that panel away and mm-hmm. then doing a one-on-one and not for six hours either. Yeah. You know, they have these super days for internships. Yeah. They are very long and exhausting. Um, we're trying to say like your interview should be, you know, 20 to 30 minutes tops. You should only have two or three at the most, because if you can't make that decision on the third interview, mm-hmm. I, I think you don't have the right hiring managers in the room to make that decision, right? right. You're going to send people six interviews is is not the way to go. I think the other way that we've rethought the interview process is we use a neurodiverse friendly hiring platform. It uses Mm. gamification. We take away time constraints. Um, You know, you can do it via video or whatever way that best suits your needs. Mm. That's the way we want to do it. And it's all in an effort to remove that anxiety that comes with interviewing. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's that's noteworthy. I mean, when when I hear about those, I've 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 mercifully never been in one of those six hour mega interviews with the Star Chamber, you know. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, on one hand, you can see that it's like they're so desperate to make sure that we don't make a mistake, and so we're just gonna keep, you know, we're gonna save our investment by like making absolutely sure that you know it's almost like an interrogation process. They figure at at hour five you'll crack and then they can they can let you go. Yeah. And paper. But they, but of course we've we've seen the the you know the consequences of this is that you're getting less and less qualified people coming through and more and more of these are just left left dangling. So that's that's very encouraging to hear um as well. But um uh, yeah. So what is uh, have you seen like a difficult path in getting this new process adopted by companies? I mean, obviously, you're working with companies that want to work with you. But is it is this the sort of thing where that you 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 roll this out and they go, oh, that's that seems yeah. a little too easy or something like that? Do you, do you get yeah. that? Off? Well, I, I think what we hear is that they feel that there's a risk associated with changing the way that they do these processes from, Mm -hmm. from interviewing to hiring to, to, to onboarding. Right. Right. Um, We as a service provider are coming in and taking that risk out because we're going to do everything for them Mm -hmm. on the front end. We're teaching them how to fish Chris, but initially we got to show them the ways of the world. Right. So we we were talking about, you know, um, you know, the, the, hiring platform that is neurodiverse friendly, but like we do some other things, right? We have a talent discovery session and that uses, that replaces more of the traditional interview process. So it's it's a hands-on evaluation um, that allows the candidates to feel more comfortable Mm -hmm. showing their talents in a supportive environment because we have folks there who are job coaches and mentors. We're kind of going through a day in the life, right? If we're in cyber and it's Again, you know, one of the positions in there, an incident response uh, job, we're going to be teaching them, okay, this is what it's going to look like. I know you might have went to school for that, or you may have not have went to school for that, but you have skills that are transferable, Yes. and this may be a great job for you, and this is what we're going to do over the next few days. Um, now, adoption is what you were talking about from those companies, right? Mm-hmm. It is again, a little bit of the risk, but they're now starting to sense and see that missing a whole, whole community of people. And, and yes. as you said, you're missing out on some skilled labor mm-hmm. that you, you should have been hiring in the first place. So yep. the changes are coming, not as fast, Chris, as we all want. Um, I think it's, it's harder for larger organizations to change that culture and make that switch a little bit easier for the mid-sized and smaller companies to do that. Um, But we need to make the case every time, right? Still a little bit of stigma, you know, that that risk as I talked about. But I think we're we're moving the needle a little bit. I wish it would go a lot quicker, right? I shouldn't, Chris, I shouldn't have this job, right? It should be built into the DNA of what companies do Mm -hmm. day in and day out. Uh, But until that day. Here I am. Here we are. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I, I wonder which is going to be harder to sort of make hiring departments let go of the idea of, of how to do 
an interview a certain way or the idea that you need to have a college degree for us to even consider you because that that was previously the one. And now that I know about this, I'm like, okay, now it's a, it's a, it's a neck and neck race between oh. things that don't work that also are, they're going to hold on to for dear life. <laughs> well, you know, that that's funny. You should mention that because you look at job descriptions and, and, you know, it says need excellent verbal and communication skills. Some mm-hmm. of the jobs almost don't require a daily back and forth between anybody. If somebody is on the spectrum and they're very literal, they're taking that. They're not even applying for the job. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We need to go back in and relook at some of the ways that we do stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's even uh, um, ways to retool a phrase like excellent verbal and written communication skills that doesn't look like such a binary on off like you either you either have it or you don't, you know, like, and explaining a little bit more about like what, what aspects of that, you know, can you be sociable? Can you not be sociable? Can you, uh, you know, if someone asks you a question, you know, is, is it going to be a, a problem for the whole day, you know, or whatever, like, right. um, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I think that, I think there's, there's so much nuance that can be in there. And I, I think you're right because I mean, we talked all the time about how, you know, uh, women applying for jobs will not apply unless they are 80 percent of, you know, the you know, they they, they 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 don't feel comfortable, like just going for it if they only have like 40 percent of the qualifications, whereas a lot of guys will will just go like, hey, you know, no is free or whatever. And so I think this yeah. is probably uh, an equivalent uh, version of that here as well, where you're you're seeing it as this sort of on off switch. Well, if I, you know, I can't write a, a full report every day to my supervisor, then this is probably not the job for me. But, you know, we're talking about like a very um, non-transparent, um, you know, membrane between potential employer and company. So they don't know what your culture looks like either. You don't know what they're look, look, looking like coming in, but you know, maybe, maybe they do require you got to meet at the bar every day at five 30 and yeah. talk about what you did, you know, and stuff. Right. So, no, absolutely. so using, using those kind of generic words like that, I think is, is equally sort of deleterious in the other direction in terms of like, showing what you're like, you know, it's one thing to say, we're a fun company or, you know, uh, you know, uh, we have a great culture or whatever, you know, but that, that can mean a lot of things. And, and having a great culture can sometimes mean, uh, which you are required to take part in (laughs) at all times. Right. Right. And, and I think, you know, having those, those required pieces, uh, are, are they 100% required or can we Mm -hmm. go a different Avenue? And I, I think if you, embed some of the processes that we're talking about today by the end of having that all put together you're going to have an employee who's extremely loyal productive and they know that they have the support that's going to help them within their career right so right. the the ROI the return on investment company wise is profitability right we'll just go with this yeah return on investment for the individual is a newfound sense of responsibility in confidence and maybe they're you know going to get their driver's license or or something to that effect something mm-hmm. that they weren't doing before now yeah. flip that back to the company the ROI is having a culture that is now shifting in a more empathetic way yeah yeah that and which is enormous so um you know we we're talking about you know companies that uh you know might have some friction around these ideas or or resisting it but without you know, necessarily using names for security reasons. Can you give me some examples of past clients who you are especially proud of the methods you used to help them find their roles or or who were especially like enthusiastic and and did yeah. things and, and and saw like measurable results? Can you give me some sort of uh, yeah. positive so, test cases? Uh, yeah, and, and I can I can talk about one in particular and, and actually name that uh, the University of Pittsburgh. Hmm. Um, you know, we came in and um we automated 83% of their Salesforce testing mm-hmm. with CAI Neurodiverse Solutions, right? There's on our website, CAI.io, you know, you can find the press release and success story and you can find a whole bunch more. Um, but, you know, they're finding the Pittsburgh piece, you know, the QA piece, the test efficiency and the testing times went down from days to hours. I mean, that's what automation is about. Um, you know, they created 150, created more than 150 tests that are run and reviewed daily. And mm-hmm. as a result of that, the university 
That is the whole 83% of automating and reducing the processing time. Like, that's huge. I mean, we're in the financial sector. Yeah. Uh, we're in the light manufacturing manufacturing easy for me to say manufacturing sector <laughs> uh, we're in the legal sector so we're hitting everything in in each one of those verticals we have success stories right yeah. so from from a mom uh in the hell you know in the healthcare industry especially there, there was a gentleman who his mom and his sister really never thought that there was going to be anything for him in a work aspect mm -hmm. just because and then we showed that we can take that young man and say, hey, listen, what if you can do this, 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 and this? Well, you know what, Chris? We got a job for you. It's at a healthcare company. You can yep. do that. And he is super successful. Super Thanks. successful. Well, let's 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 sort of talk then from there about sort of um, uh, good fits and things. We we, sure. we 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 walked past it a little bit earlier, but to go a little deeper, can you talk about some areas of – the cybersecurity industry specifically that are ideally suited to neurodivergent candidates, or, you know, if we can sort of like break down some of the, the, the job roles and what you've seen is an especially good match for, for, um, for. People. Yeah. I, and, and I think, you know, we talked about uh, the compliance, the SOC, the incident mm -hmm. response, um, yep. those jobs that are very detail oriented, mm -hmm. I think lend well. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, pattern recognition. Um, you know, and, and one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Rex, you know, who I think you met at I met the, Rex too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. I mean, he is like a wealth of this is why we need to be doing this, right? So yep. he runs down strong concentration, problem solving abilities, high work standards in the ethic, uh, memorizing and learning information quickly visual process thinkers, bringing new approaches to that. Like all of those things, I think you could take to any cyber job and yeah. apply them, right? Right, now, right. Chris, I, I get that there's different levels of what you can and cannot do. And yeah. we, we get that. But we shouldn't pigeonhole to say that you can only do these five jobs in cyber. Yes, exactly. Right. And, and I think as you're probably a little bit more close to it, jobs are evolving new job oh, yeah. titles are coming mm -hmm. a new you know way of doing something or a new coding mechanism or a new way to bring data together like that's coming and that's mm -hmm. going to be a different job and mm -hmm. you know what people like us CAI neurodiverse solutions we need to be on the cutting edge of that so that we right. can help you figure yeah. out where that talent is going to come from yeah i mean do you do you sort of keep do you have sort of parts of your company that keep their ear to the ground in in terms of those type of job roles yeah, uh, you know i assume you would have to right we do because we are, you know, on the other side of it is all technology, right? So mm -hmm. we, we do have a cyber um, uh, piece to us. We, 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 we have, you know, the help desk piece. We have all of those pieces. Anything in technology, we pretty much do. So what has to happen is we have to talk internally. So maybe we're not seeing something on CAI neurodiverse side, but in the public sector, they're like, oh, my God, you, this is the newest thing. Mm -hmm. And people are going to be clamoring for this. So we need to start putting some training modules together for whatever it is. Yeah. And we're like, yes. And then it just it really dovetails together nicely. Cool. OK, excellent. So um, recently I interviewed Ian Campbell from Domain Tools, who also uh, runs a um a neurodivergent uh, uh, ERG for his company. And he gave me a quote that kind of blew my mind and I want to read it to you. It's, okay. it's from a Rand Corporation study about national security roles. Uh, and it was a sentiment that was echoed after it was said by a federal hiring manager when they spoke to you. And it's, uh, the quote was, these missions are too important and too critical to be left to people who only think in typical ways. So uh, I, was, I was like, so what are your what are your thoughts on this? Given your close proximity and working relationships with cyber firms and, and job roles, do you see examples of such forward thinking about autism and neurodiversity in in other places? And 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 what do you think of that 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 sentiment? Yeah. Um, well, let's let's break it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, autism is is one piece of neurodiversity, right? So yeah, they're they're not separate things, which is which is yep. absolutely fine, right? Mm -hmm. But we do need to know that there's 
the the typical way of going about things is not going to last long, right? It mm -hmm. may last for a year or something like that, but then some new piece of thinking needs to kind of pop in to kind of, I don't know, kick the tires or throw a monkey wrench in it, so to speak. Um, you know, we, we had a financial institution um, who had ATMs that were off by a zero, zero, one penny, right? They couldn't right. figure it out, couldn't reconcile, tried to figure out the programming for uh, quite a long time. And we put a team in there and one in a neurodivergent associate came in and identified a different way to look and solve that problem within the first month. Save the company millions of dollars wow. uh, in the first six months of implementation. So that's a perfect example of how different ways of thinking and methodologies reduce error and increase prof profitability. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, Ian Campbell is right on. It is too important and too critical, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to cost me, you know, my stock is at $22 and I, you know, I couldn't get my revenue to where it needed to be because now I had a $5 million gap. Well, geez, I, I would have yeah. fixed that for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. That's why we all it all comes back to the circle. Yeah, it does. And and yeah, and I think that's a, another thing that we talk about here all the time and have been talking about even before, um, you know, neurodiverse uh, topics have come in is that just we need everybody working on this because these problems are not just you know, it's not a, a sort of like a pre-built kit like you don't there's no right. it's not like a, it's not like a hint book for a video game like there might be. <laughs> completely unusual solutions to problems that yeah. you're not going to get, you know, whether you are physically disabled or uh, oh. have, have physical disability or, or, you know, a neurodiverse or, um, you know, uh, just have a different economic background or a different, you know, from other, other parts of the world and stuff like that. And so I think it's, it's just always worth reminding that this is, this is a very large playing field that we're working on and it doesn't necessarily have conventional uh solutions the way that you would you would think in terms of like you know like a mousetrap or a Rube goldberg puzzle or something right. like that we're going to have to figure out things by thinking very 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 laterally and so i think that's again why uh you know getting as many different uh brains and hearts and minds into the into the conversation is going to be so right. crucial. no I, I agree a thousand percent with you i mean you and i could talk for about six hours um about the subject and and go yeah. back and forth and talk about all the nuances that make up mm -hmm. why we need to be doing this in more spaces than what we are currently yeah absolutely so um although your role is facilitating neurodivergent candidates into job roles that suit their strengths do you have any advice or tips for neurodivergent learners or learners with autism or other spectrum uh, things who are out either picking their area of study based on their strengths and capacity. So we said, as you yeah. said, there's, there's these different buckets and it's like, well, this is perfect. This is perfect. Like that might still feel weird. Do, do you uh, like work with candidates who are still in the focused learning phase of their career and sort of yeah. trying to figure out what they want to do? uh with themselves yeah so i like i said i have the uh the coolest job right so mm -hmm. i can go to the the colleges and universities and you know do all those other things and meet people and yep. the first thing i say is find your passion right mm -hmm. so you're going to school for x what is it about x that you love to do mm -hmm. okay you don't love to do it well maybe you should uh, let's let's veer to the right or to the left a little bit. Yes. Um, find what you do best, right? Passion mm -hmm. is one thing. What you do best is a completely different thing. Yeah. Um, and that's that's actually a part of our assessment process as well. Um, you know, what are their cognitive and behavioral skills that align with what they like to do? You know, mm -hmm. we talked about transferable skills. Talk about the cyber industry. I don't know if, you know, in, an incident response person can go to a SOC analyst, can go to a compliance analyst, analyst can go to access and identity management. But there's got to be some little pieces of that that can, can kind of intertwine. Oh, yeah. And that's what we're trying to draw out of these individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pick your – here's what happens a lot. They, they do okay. have a passion, and then – parent caregiver guardian is is kind of moving them where they think that their yes. function should be mm -hmm. um, and then we're seeing that the young adults and adults are like 
it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but you know, it was thought that it would be best that I go this route. Based, based on on past performance, this is what right. my family agreed would be best for me. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and think about it this way: you know, mm-hmm. a lot of our candidates are either recent grads or it's their first employment opportunity, or they're right out of high school with certifications. Right? We talked about mm-hmm. that not having that that degree. Yeah, education is great, though. I'm not saying that you shouldn't get your degree, but it's not for everybody. Right. Um. You know. If they want to continue that education process, if, if they feel the need, please do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're going to let you know what you potentially need to upskill as we go through yeah. the process. Um, and we're going to say what you need to do to get to that next step. So when you have that completed, we got the role for you. Mm-hmm. So keep the machine of learning moving. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's superb. I'm, I'm going to get that engraved into a, a, a decorative plate and hang it. <laughs> keep, <laughs> keep the, <laughs> the machine and learning rolling. Uh, so um, yeah, another thing that, that uh, the aforementioned Ian Campbell said that really stuck with me was that in working with accommodating neurodivergent professionals, he stressed that, quote, there is discomfort in the process and the discomfort will have to be a two-way street for a while. So he was talking about that, you know, yes, companies are going to have to find new ways to accommodate and there's also going to be a, a certain level of like, this is not going to, no matter how accommodating, you know, things yeah. are going to be, it's still going to be uncomfortable. So, so for people with certain learning and working methods, uh, even the ideally lit slash volume modulated slash time accommodating schedule can get chaotic fast. So what advice yeah. do you have for newly placed professionals to make sure that they are also doing the due diligence they need to do to keep growing and developing in ways that are beneficial for the company uh, as well as for them? Yeah. So I, I think it's, all about the support that okay. we're going to get, right? So mm-hmm. a two-way street, kind of discomfort, right? We're, we're, yeah. we're teaching the client what to do. We we have a mm-hmm. pretty well-oiled machine on support because we have team leads and the job coaches and the mentors. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're there to support the advocacy of them looking to grow and develop, right? Right. Uh, it, the growing and develop can be internally or it could be the next level of their job, right? From, yes. you know, analyst one to analyst two to analyst three. What what are those skill sets that you need? Great, great, great. But you also have to look at the, the internal piece to that person. Uh, and we're very upfront with clients, right? The discomfort, you know, if you want us to fill that role, we do want that opportunity for them to have the career path and mobility as we talked about earlier. A lot of folks don't want to be stuck in that one role, but there are folks, Chris, Mm -hmm. perfectly acceptable to stay in the current job that they got. And that is absolutely fine. And the company needs to be fine with that as well. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, You know, and, and I think giving those growth opportunities is one thing, but in order to give them growth opportunities, you got to give them feedback. Mm-hmm. You know, either on the spot or in a cadence, uh, you know, so that they can do their job well and continue to develop. Um, yes. That's the discomfort, right? If you're a hiring mm-hmm. manager or you're the manager of individuals and you're like, uh, I don't know where, where Chris or Anthony should go or Sally or Michelle, that manager is the impetus for that person to either move on and succeed or to be stagnant in that role. And I would hope the vetting process, the discomfort of vetting a manager Mm -hmm. is the most important piece because you need to know, does their team currently, you know, respect and accept their feedback? Do they get the feedback in in a, in a timely fashion? Meaning, you know, is it every week, every month, whatever it is like, that's a huge role. And I think, um, People have, especially managers, have kind of, you know, sat back, all right, performance review, got this, all right, check off the box, do this each day. Now is the time you got to kind of be engaged. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a great point. And and to sort of circle back to what you said there, uh, some people want to keep moving up in the company, want to take on more responsibilities. Other people want to keep doing the thing. But there's there's still, as you said, as opposed to the sort of stagnancy of it, there's a difference between I want to keep doing my same role versus I want right. to be doing the exact same job responsibilities. Like it's right. it's still very possible to keep your one sort of like 
plateau or, or spot in the company and still find other ways to make it more fulfilling or uh, greater than it was before, you know, yeah. greater in the sense of larger, you know, that, right, uh, right, right, right. Um, yep, you know, and, and again, that just requires a little extra effort on the manager's part on hiring's part to understand like we, okay, well, here's, here's, here's a path that we haven't necessarily seen before. So we, you stay here, but you also take on these other things that make your job, you know, more satisfying or more productive or whatever. But the, the, the add on to that, Chris is senior leadership has to have that buy-in too, right? Absolutely. So as managers give the feedback up the food chain, Senior leaders got to recognize, all right, so we just realized that three of our folks are great at this and, you know, they're making a thousand widgets a day doing this. Um, but the manager's telling that there's another opportunity over here to do something completely different with that widget. Mm -hmm. You got to say, OK, well, let's let's senior leaders got to say, well, we should try that job function. Maybe that person who is doing that widget today could transfer over there because they already know the process and the product. Yeah, right? we 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 got to get to that level of acceptance. Yeah, and yeah, and I think there's I think there's something to that as well. If 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 someone says, "Do you want to move up to this next thing?" and you say, "No, I just want to keep doing this," um, that doesn't mean that I can't. We might can ask you again in a year. We have this yeah. other thing. Maybe this is more suited to you. And they say yes. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. I I absolutely agree. And I yeah. don't think that there. You know, a lot of the times you'll hear that. You know repercussions because um, you know uh, Tammy didn't want to move. I didn't take the I didn't take the brass ring. Yeah, the, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you know what? Um, first of all, that's Tammy's decision. Is she doing a bang up job in that that mm -hmm. position? Is she hitting her goal and her productivity is awesome and she's finding these defects and yep. making resolution? Okay. What's the issue? Yeah. What's the issue? <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, as you said, we could talk for six hours about the, the sort of nuances <laughs> of all this, but I want to I want to get you on your way here. So as we wrap up today, are there any initiatives or new programs or special events CAI is part of in the coming months that you'd like our listeners to know more about? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we continue to get asked to do these types of, of media engagements. Um, that's our opportunity to spread awareness and promote acceptance of neurodiversity mm -hmm. in the workplace. Um, I have a few more speaking engagements through the end of the year. Okay. Uh, National Association of Counties, a Tech Titans panel. Um, but again, you know, at the end of the day, my job is to make sure that I'm engaging the entire community across the United States and, you know, even across the globe. Um, we strive to be that person first organization uh, and we're always going to do the right thing that will benefit that individual. Um, yes. And then, like I said, the, you know, the major conferences of disability in, you know, there's 4,500 people that go to that. That is absolutely outstanding. So if you ever get the opportunity to, to go, it's in Vegas this year. Um, it, it's quite, quite, quite the scene. Awesome. Good to know. I'm going to put that on my calendar. So one final question. If our listeners want to learn more about you and Anthony Pasilio or CAA and Neurodiverse Solutions, where should they look online? Yeah, definitely have the LinkedIn, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, Anthony Pasilio. Um, and then you can also go to CAI.io yep. and then you'll be able to see our uh, Neurodiverse Solutions kind of drop down. And then okay. there you'll find all the success stories, the videos and yep. and all that good stuff that that comes along with CAI Neurodiverse Solutions. Sweet. All right. Well, Anthony, thanks so much for your time and insights today. I know our listeners uh, will be very excited about what they they heard, and, and I hope they can apply it to their careers. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. So, and th thank you as always to our CyberWork listeners and video viewers, whether this is your first episode or you've been with us since the very beginning, we're grateful to have you along for the journey. So before I go, I hope uh, you'll remember to visit infosecinstitute.com slash free to get a whole bunch of free and exclusive stuff for CyberWork listeners. So we start off with our bootcamp promo offer from now until December 31st, 2023. By the time this drops, that'll be very close. If you book a bootcamp with InfoSec, you'll get $500 off the purchase price. No promo needed. Just go to InfoSec institute.com slash free and browse the available boot camps. There's also our new security awareness training series work bites, which is awesome. And I encourage you all to watch the trailer. InfosecInstitute.com slash free is also the place to go for your cybersecurity talent development ebook, which is free, uh, where you will find our in-depth training plans for the 12 most common security roles, some of which we talked about today, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. 
One more time, infosecinstitute.com slash free. And yes, as always, the link will be in the description below. Thank you once again to Anthony Pasilio and Pasilio. I keep doing it right. Is it Pasilio? Pasillo. Pasilio. Pasilio. Thanks once again to Anthony Pasilio and CAI. And thank you all so much for watching and listening. Uh, and by the time this drops, I hope you'll have a happy holidays and a happy new year. And we will speak to you in the new year. And until then, happy learning. <laughs>